As we know, Richard Allen was arrested at the end of October in the Delphi case, but there is some really interesting information of the wording of his charges. And a judge is also not too happy and he's worried about his safety and he did something about it. I also received a very interesting and worrisome picture of Richard Allen that you just gotta see. Also, Libby's sister Kelsey is requesting some signatures in a petition. We're gonna talk about that in today's Delphi case update video. So now, let's get into it. Richard Allen was charged with two counts of murder. And in the state of Indiana, thanks to you guys for helping me out, there's just murder charges, there's no degrees. Now what's interesting is in numerous sources it says, the docket says Allen is charged with murder under, and then the code, which is a murder involving a specific underlying criminal offense. Now the statute that he's charged under it indicates that he has to have committed also another crime like child molestation, human trafficking, the list goes on and I will put that here as I talk so you could read it and I don't get slapped for saying it on YouTube. Now one reporter asked Superintendent Doug Carter, he asks if he was charged properly and Doug Carter says he is and those questions will be answered in due time and they certainly should come from the prosecutor and not from me but eventually when the PC, probable cause, affidavit is released that will be clear and I also read another little section and it says a felony murder charge can also be lodged against a defendant who may not have actually committed the killings but participated in the events that led up to the deaths but I have to counter that because I believe that this charge or these charges against Richard Allen is because they think he is BG the bridge guy. From Mike Patty and Becky Patty, they also believe that this is bridge guy. And speaking of Richard Allen, he has until November 17th to get himself a lawyer. He had requested one before and he had 20 days and that brings us to November 17th. Now let's switch gears for a second and talk about Keaton Klein because we cannot forget about him. He's the 28 year old guy who had the fake Anthony Schatz account and I will do a separate video on him, but he hasn't been charged in this Delphi case, but he is sitting in jail and he has a disgusting amount of charges. There's 30 of them, but recently five have been dropped. We will discuss that in detail in my Keegan Klein video. And the reporter asks Doug Carter again, he says, on Keegan Klein, the prosecutor dismissed five charges. Is there any correlation between those charges being dropped and the search that was performed in the Wabash River? Hopefully I said that right. I know there's probably 5,000 ways to say it. Let me know below. Carter says, no, absolutely not. I think he was charged with 30 counts and they have dropped five, so it is 25. So it is important the case has not been dropped against Keegan Klein. Now, no, there's no answer here that I saw about the search in the river, only about the charges. Interesting. And we gotta go back to the sketches because the sketches keeping a topic of conversation. There were two sketches, one in 2017, which is when the girls were murdered, and one in 2019. It left us confused. There's discrepancies for sure from, you know, reports in the past. But in one of my last videos, I talked about Doug Carter saying that they would be combined together and that would make the sketch of BG or bridge guy. But in other reports, in earlier reports, the police said that it was not the same person, that the original sketch is no longer the person of interest, the new sketch is described as having this youthful appearance, but could fall in the age of 20s to 30s. So it also says the person could look different if he has grown a mustache, beard, or let his hair grow longer or cut his hair shorter than the sketch. And in a recent interview with Doug Carter, the question was asked about the two sketches again. And the reporter said, that guy and that guy, referring to the side-by-side -side videos of him, there are a lot of similarities. How did we get from here to here? Doug Carter says, well, I think you'll remember I have said from the very beginning since 2017, a sketch is a sketch. It is not a photograph. That is the first time I've seen that and I have also indicated over time that once we get where we are today, we will be able to look at the similarities and make a photograph, which will be Richard Allen. I think there is a little bit of both and I don't regret that strategy by any means. Let me know what your thoughts are about the sketches because it can get pretty confusing. Now let's talk about the judge. 
Last week, he recused himself from the case. And in a document, he used wording like bloodlust, toxic, and imminent danger. He recused himself shortly after announcing that Richard Allen would be moved and transferred to a state facility. In the documents, it says the court being duly advised finds the defendant is an inmate awaiting trial and is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death or represents a substantial threat to the safety of others. The finding is not predicated on any acts or alleged acts of the defendant since arrest, rather a toxic and harmful insistence on public information about defendant and this case. And he goes on, I'm not going to read all of it, I'll read little chunks of it. It says, yet concurrent to the actual case natural occurring, this judicial officer keeps getting direct requests from non-parties for public information, claiming that this officer has seven days or one day when hand-delivered to respond to the request or face litigation, with an exclamation mark. While this officer is responsible for the entirety of the circuit court docket, it attempts to ignore the maelstrom of interest from the public. It is known that YouTube already hosts content regarding family members of this judicial officer, including photos. And it said that the judge's family were put on YouTube. I have no idea where it was or, um, you know, who did it, but it happened. I don't understand why, but it's out there. It says the public's blood lust for information before it exists is extremely dangerous. All public servants administering this action do not feel safe and are not protected. And then he goes on, but it also says, the court notes for the public that when defendant appeared for the initial hearing, he was clad in protective gear. That protection was not to protect defendant from the court. That protection was to protect defendant from the public. So the judge then recuses himself and now there's a new judge put in place. Her name is Judge Fran Gull and she's been a judge since 1997. She's been re-elected four times. It said that she's been recognized for her work in helping the jury communicate to the court administrators via text or QR codes. It said in December 2021, Judge Gull opted in a pilot project that allowed media cameras in five different Indiana trial courts and it is typically prohibited so that's interesting another thing that I saw was there was an email from that judge that recused himself and he says just so the world knows the Carroll Circuit Court consists of me Benjamin a diner the judge my court reporter was hired Friday and began Monday my bailiff answers the phone he has no experience and no knowledge about legal process Thankfully, there is a court administrator that has experience, but she has duties regarding Carroll Circuit and Carroll Superior Courts. That is it. So I am begging for some assistance to shield me, the court, from this storm so that I, the court, can keep running the court. Then he recused himself. Otherwise, I'll do what? Read to everyone Rule 6A of Indiana Rules of Court, rules on access to court records, and explain to everyone that the Supreme Court and statute allows for this precise relief. It is not the court who has a duty to notify the public. It is the prosecuting attorney's office as the requester. Is it honestly the judge's duty to reply to each non-party request for information and explain why, when a request is rendered confidential until a hearing, it is a logical impossibility to acknowledge the existence of the confidential information? Information. Just sending this inquiry took 15 minutes of my time. Imagine actually responding to each of these requests. Please advise. In other court news, there's actually a lawsuit against Carroll County Sheriff's Office and Tobe or Tobias Leesenby. We've seen him throughout this case for the last five and a half years. There's a deputy who's suing him. His name is Michael Thomas. And he's claiming because of his stance on the Delphi case from the beginning that the administration didn't approve of his run for office. He was running for office. He said some things about the Delphi case and things happened from there. He said he recommended that experts be brought in from the very beginning and he said that those recommendations were actually ignored. In a document it states, upon Thomas's information and belief, Leesonby and others in the CCSO did not approve of Thomas running for office in part because Thomas had made suggestions and offered assistance in the investigation of a high profile child homicide investigation which was overruled and which Leesonby and others in the CCSO feared would become publicized as a result of the campaign and or Thomas's potential election. Now, when Abby and Libby were found, Michael Thomas was the chief deputy, which is the second highest ranking of the 12 deputies in the sheriff's office. And he took a lead role, it says, in the investigation. He says, 
the bigger agencies were involved from day one, so I was deeply involved in the beginning. And that involvement also included conversations with the Carroll County Prosecuting Office, and it was the prosecutor Robert Ives, or Eves. And Michael says, this crime is unique to this area as well as pretty much a lot of different areas, and there are experts out there that have dealt with this sort of thing before, and I believe that it could have been very beneficial. In the very first weeks of the double homicide, I wanted to bring experts in, and I was given the task by the Carroll County prosecutor and basically they didn't like what I had to say and it kind of went downhill from there. These conversations were actually confirmed with the prosecutor and that prosecutor said, I do recall discussing with Chief Deputy Mike Thomas the possibility of seeking additional experts in the Delphi case. I thought there were aspects of the investigation that needed experts that the team had not sought. And Michael Thomas said, I feel that since the moment that I had a disagreement with the sheriff about this investigation that it went downhill ever since. I just felt like there were certain individuals within the command structure that didn't want to go to that direction. So Michael Thomas ran for office. He lost out to a candidate. It was said that was chosen by Tobe or Tobias Leesonby and it was said that he was promised the chief deputy post in the new administration but three days later he was demoted. He says I was pulled into the sheriff's office and he spoke to me about it and handed me a letter about it and basically said due to recent events I'm taking you back to patrol level. So once Michael Thomas got demoted, he said that it's taken a toll and not getting, you know, increase of pay, reduced authority. He said um, having to go on a 12 hour road shift, demeaning comments, and he was concerned about his personal safety while on patrol. He seemed to have been upset also about the sheriff's office not taking a stronger hand in updating the community of what's going on. I mean, we haven't seen a whole lot of press conferences in the last six years either from that, but he was upset about it. And he said he wanted the office, the sheriffs, to correct rumors and conspiracy theories. And he says, I would say, take a look at everything, speak to people that have been in similar situations and what they have learned from these types of investigations and go from there and be transparent with the public as much as you possibly can without losing the integrity of the case. With all these conspiracies and theories and stuff like that, it's law enforcement's job to try to put a stop to some of this stuff because it's not doing the case any good. What are your thoughts about that? Let me know below and we'll have a little chit chat. Now, Richard Allen actually had a call to his home back in 2015. It was June 18th at 3.30 in the morning and Richard was drunk and his wife took him to the hospital for a medical evaluation. Now, Sheriff Leesonby said that no one law enforcement action was involved in this other than responding and just keeping the peace. And it's not clear of what treatment Richard got, if any, at the hospital. So let's talk about the picture that I was sent. And well, let's just, see. Let's just take a look. Looks like uh, Rick is hard at work. I just don't even know what to say about this picture. I saw it and I thought, oh dear, this is gonna be a meme. It's almost like a George Costanza kind of a vibe. I don't, I don't know what he's doing. Clearly he's getting paid because he looks like he has his tag on and he's working and getting paid to do whatever it is he's doing. I do wonder who took the picture and what that conversation was like. I'm sure it's gonna be a meme. Now Libby's sister Kelsey would like a petition sign. She had it on her Twitter account. She's looking for 50,000 signatures at the time of this recording. It's at 38,250. And what she would like is to petition to keep the probable cause affidavit sealed. I think we could do a good job of this. I know you guys will probably want to sign it. I'll have that link in the description box below. Now court for those documents will be on November the 22nd and Doug Carter talked about it and he says, while I know that you're all expecting final details today concerning this arrest, today is not that day. This investigation is far from complete and we will not jeopardize its integrity by releasing or discussing documents or information before the appropriate time. And there was a discussion with somebody who's not part of the case but said there may be other individuals that they are seeking to apprehend and there could be details they don't want getting out to the public to control the quality of that investigation. I'm betting there's more. They always talk about how complicated this is and we still can't forget about Keegan Klein so I'm, I'm curious about this. Do you think there's more people? Let me know below. But a former prosecutor did say, quite frankly, I've never seen after the charges are actually filed an initial hearing has taken place a case where the evidence is sealed. But the judge wrote, all information will be available the second it exists. Most of the public interest consists of people attempting to raise their status or profit financially.
Richard Allen is currently held without bond. It was a $20 million bond, but it was changed to no bond. And since the press conference happened on October 31st, it's been reported that there's been over 300 tips. Could be a lot more now. And from that press conference, we heard the prosecution say, we're keeping the tip line open, the tip email open. We encourage everybody to continue to call in tips, not only about Richard Allen, but also about any other person you may have. For that reason and for the nature of this case, the probable cause affidavit and the charging information has been sealed by the court. He says this investigation is still very much ongoing. And something else that I saw in my research was that they hired a private security guard to monitor the CVS where Richard Allen worked, which was very interesting. I'm sure that's a little odd for people to see in a teeny tiny town like Delphi, who has under 3,000 people residents. Watch for my Keegan Klein video, make any requests you want in this case down below, and also here's what you can watch next. Thank you so much for watching, we'll see you soon.